the good news, though, is that central banks are thinking about this, and there has been a recognition that in the in the digital realm, uh, central banks need to um, you know quickly adopt a new new framework. Um, I, I know as I'm listening to the other speakers uh, talking about currencies, it's a loose term. People just say. Well, we can trade this currency or that currency or make up a new currency. Um, and we have to be careful when we talk about currency because currency is essentially a, a sovereign uh, instrument. Um, and in every country, it is underpinned by the law of the nation or, in some cases, the law of the union. And, and these currencies represent a liability on the central bank. It is not a casual. Um, uh, instrument where you know someone wakes up and says, "Now I have cooked up a new currency because my uh, latest technology allows me to define it as a currency." It doesn't work that way. So you're, the point that you're raising, Dong, is that we have um, sovereign instruments that are underpinned by the law of the nation that creates a currency that works within the nation's boundaries. Now, rising above that, we have some international reserve currencies. So you have reserve currencies that are also recognized as assets by multiple countries. There are, uh, there are several of those. Um, and so for a transaction to take place from country A to country B, uh, it's not just a, a matter of uh, two uh, uh, currencies sort of coming together. It's a, it's a matter of exchanging from the originating currency into a reserve or a recognized international currency and then back out again. And this is primarily true in, in, in developing markets, in developed markets um, where the country's currency happens to be a reserve currency, well, there's essentially only one exchange that takes place or the recipient is willing to accept, accept the reserve currency. In the digital world, the question that you asked is, is quite pertinent. In the digital world, with two countries having a central bank issued digital instrument, how does that exchange happen? Now, the way we see it is that for that exchange to happen in an efficient way, number one, central banks have to participate. So this is not an exercise with just the private sector trying to make this happen. The, the bilateral nature of two central banks that are in the payment flow have to participate because they become ballast. Uh, basically underwriting their own currency on what we call or what we would think about as an international cross-border bus. Once they are the ballots on, the, on this cross-border bus, private sector participants can participate because they're essentially regulated by their in-country central bank and the rules of the road are pretty well defined. Um, and so there can be a direct connection between private sector participants in country A and private sector participants in country B. In the middle, in the middle, there has to be an automated mechanism for the exchange to take place, meaning country A's originating currency gets converted into an exchange currency, and country B then uh, subsequently uh, turns it back into, into the local currency. And this whole process can be automated as long as the security boundaries of the bus um, are, are, are secure so that the liquidity or the, the transaction within the bus can be ensured, the uh, exchange from A to B, uh, A to common currency, common currency back to B can take place. The, the participation of the central banks is what provides the balance on this bus. Once the part, central banks are participating, the ability to execute from a CBDC in country A back to a CBDC in country B becomes eminently doable. The technology then that allows this to happen has to be essentially adopted by, uh, by the central banks. And this is what e-currency focuses on, is to really allow central banks to get up to par on the, on the technology such that the private sector participants, whether that be commercial banks, e-money operators, payment service providers, or even new entrants like some of my colleagues are, can then participate on it to allow for this cross-border uh, thing to happen.
I want to go back to the original point I made when I spoke earlier, which is eliminating the risk components, the settlement risk component, the counterparty risk component, and ultimately reducing the amount of liquidity needed to execute a cross-border transaction is what will bring the cost of cross-border transactions down and the risks associated with cross-border transactions down. So that's what we, we try to enable. 